again and welcome to episode three of we need to talk about dot 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 three episodes <laughs> back by well I'd, I'd like to say back by popular demand but <laughs> we have as fans we have as fans we, we have a small elite elite following i like to say you know we, we have we have the elite and we love you all we do indeed <laughs> Well, we've mentioned for, for today's episode, um, we've talked about this particular film in our last two episodes, and now it's finally time to give it the we need to talk about dot dot dot, 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 dot. treatments. Uh, we've been to the 60s with Casino Royale, we travelled to the 70s with Zardos, and now it's time to pass around the crackers because we've got some proper 80s cheese for you here. It's Life Force time. It is Life Force. Now, you. <laughs> now, you did. You have actually reviewed this film before, have you not? Uh, yes, it was only like a, a short review that I did of it, but that's when it was at one of the Leeds um, horror film festivals. But for this video, we're going to cover it in somewhat more detail and more depth, and uh, we're also going to talk about the uh, the distribution company that Life Force came from. The, uh, oh boy, <laughs> the infamous <laughs> Canon, Canon film films. group. Yes. So let's talk about the plot first of all. Astronauts from the British space program find a giant spaceship, shaped like an artichoke for some reason, and discover within it a number of giant, desiccated, bat-like creatures, along with three perfectly preserved, yet completely naked, humanoid life forms. Oh yes, I should point out, this film has got excessive female nudity. The decision is made to bring these humanoids back to Earth, which leads to damn near apocalyptic results, as not only do they have some questionable morals about actually putting some damn clothes on, but they then also start sucking the life force out of people, reducing them to hideous, shrieking, mindless zombies that in turn seek out the life force of other people, and will actually explode into dust if they don't get to feed. This offsets the stage for plenty of excessive female nudity, fountains of blood, whirlpools of thunder, and some hilariously bad dialogue such as... This woman is a masochist. An extreme masochist. And... Not at all. I'm a natural voyeur. And that's only within, within one scene. Despite appearances, this woman is a masochist. An extreme masochist. She wants me to force the name out of her. She wants me to hurt her. I can see the images in her mind. Do you want to stay? Otherwise, wait outside! Not at all. I am a natural voyeur. I should mention that the security guards point out that a naked woman is not going to be able to get out of this complex. Then offer the same naked lady space vampire a nice biscuit to stop her from escaping. Yeah, that'll work. Life Force was originally offered to a regular Canon Films contributor, Michael Winner. He of the endless Death Wish movies. But then it ended up in the hands of Toby Hooper. After the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Hooper struggled to find the same commercial and critical acclaim. His follow up, Eaten Alive, was not well received, and Hooper himself had walked off the film set after a disagreement with the producers. It took the TV movie of Stephen King's Salem's Lot to get him back on track as a director. Due to the nature of this being for TV, Hooper had to rein in the shocks and gore to be replaced with atmosphere and suggestion. It certainly worked, as he was then hired to direct Poltergeist, working from a story from Steven Spielberg, although there's still questions to this day about whether or not Spielberg took control of that film during the production. Uh, but it didn't matter, because having his name attached to the film certainly didn't do Hooper any harm. It was off the back of this film that Hooper was offered a free picture deal with Canon, who was hoping that they'd be able to capture some of that same mainstream attention as what Poltergeist got. Life Force is arguably the most successful of these three films that he made for canon. Hooper's woeful remake of Invaders from Mars and the sequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 uh, were critical and commercial flops, although they have since cultivated a really good cult following. Life Force started as Colin Wilson's novel The Space Vampires, with the author taking inspiration from the works of H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. This was then adapted into a screenplay written by Dan O'Bannon and David Jacobi. 
O'Bannon was already well versed in the science fiction horror genre as the writer of Alien, co-writer of John Carpenter's first film Dark Star, and had also contributed to the special computer effects of a very small 1977 science fiction art house movie that you may have heard of, Star Wars. Star Wars? Yes, I think I've heard of that. It was a very good film from what I remember. I can't understand why they didn't make any sequels. Or prequels. <laughs> Moving <Sorry>. on. <laughs> O'Bannon had also written and directed The Return of the Living Dead, another movie well known for its excessive female nudity and gore. Uh, not only to that, but Hooper himself contributed some story ideas, most notably the use of Halley's Comet. Now, Halley's Comet was uh, perceived to be uh, a harbinger of doom. Um, most notably, Halley's Comet actually appears in the Bayek's Tapestry mm. uh, as a sort of a harbinger of doom before. Uh, Poor old King Harold gets one in the eye. Yeah, and and also just just to get a little bit more astrological, uh, you know, a little bit more, you know, you know, astrophysics and, and, and what have you. Um, Halley's Comet was uh, this film came out in 1985. Yes. Halley's Comet was next seen the year after in 1986, and that's the last time that, that, that up, up until now that's the last time we've seen Halley's Comet. So it's actually a year before, you know, a year before Halley's Comet was passing through, passing through this, our solar system. Uh, that's what, I mean, that was part, part one of the reasons why Hooper decided why to put changed, that yeah. change into place because Haley's Comet was due to pass by Earth the following year of the film's release. Which is very, very interesting, actually, just to go on a, even more of a slight tangent because at the same time that, that was, uh, at the same time that the Churchill is up there sort of landing in Haley's Comet and what have you, down here on Earth, the Cybermen are trying to basically <laughs> um, alter the path of, of, of Haley's Comet. So in, in in Attack of the Cybermen, it's all part of an extended universe. It, it is indeed. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, you know, you know, they were they were trying to do that to weaken Earth's defences. So when the actual original cyber invasion from the tenth planet happens, then they would win. <laughs> Funnily enough, uh, one of the excellent <laughs> one of the guys in here, um, <laughs> Peter Firth, who plays uh, Colonel Kane. I actually do think when sort of watching me this, you know, he would have made an excellent. Uh, an excellent Doctor Who. Very, very good we're, actor. We're totally very, sort very of digressing good. here. Massively so. Um, so this was a change um, from the Churchill landing in an asteroid belt, uh, which was in the book, and the time of the story was also then changed to the then present day. Um, so not only did you have this awesome sort of pedigree going on behind the scenes in terms of the writing, but also the special effects mm. as well. The special effects were by uh, John Dixter, who had worked on the original television series for Battlestar Galactica, as well as Star Trek The Motion Picture, and the original Star Wars trilogy. And then, just to add in even more connections to Star Trek, throw in the not quite yet completely bold Patrick Stewart, who delivers a performance that not only contains more ham than a deli counter, but would also prepare him very, very well for his later assimilation into the Borg Collective. Mm. And would feature his first ever on-screen kiss. With a bloke. With another man, Steve Railsback. <laughs> um, Furthermore, the soundtrack is a rousing, thunderous score written by Henry Mancini and performed by the London Symphony Orchestra. Oh, ah, yes, and also, did we mention that this has got excessive female nudity? <laughs> I don't think we did, no. <laughs> so, you have a well-regarded genre writer, a well-regarded pioneering genre director, a legend in the special effects world, an amazing composer on the soundtrack, and a whopping 25 million dollar budget to make the movie with. So how could this possibly go wrong? Well, uh, the film took an absolute critical and commercial mauling. <laughs> it, it didn't really help that it was released on the very same day as Ron Howard's science fiction movie, Cocoon. Now that film had only cost $17.5 million to make, and it had a recognisable star in Steve Guttenberg on board. So it was more likely to make all its money back due to the film being family friendly. Lifehouse was also facing stiff competition from the likes of The Goonies and Rambo, which didn't exactly help them further. Now these days, the release of a movie will often be delayed by a studio to avoid clashing with another bigger movie that might affect their ticket sales. Steven Spielberg's own recent film, Ready Player One, is a recent example of this being delayed by several months to avoid clashing with the likes of Star Wars The Last Jedi and Black Panther, which could have cost them ticket sales. But this was Canon Films, and Canon was not your typical studio. Ah, uh, Canon. <laughs> the film studio that also brought us the likes of Masters of the Universe, 
Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. Th that insane Hercules movie where Lou Ferrigno throws a bear into space and multiple titles featuring Chuck Norris, Charles Bronson, Jean-Claude Van Damme, boatloads of ninjas and all that fucking dancing. Even to this day, hearing and seeing the classic Canon logo and theme music brings up a load of memories. And not all of them good. No. Purchased in 1979 by Israeli co cousins Manaheim Golan and Yoram Globus, the Go-Go Boys had forged themselves a career in Hollywood by making and releasing as many movies as possible in a single calendar year, no matter how lowbrow or bottom of the barrel these movies might have seemed. The record, if memory serves correctly, is, is 43? 43 in a single 43 calendar year. 43 movies that in a single insane. calendar year. <laughs> no one has ever done that. No one has ever done that before, no one has ever done that since. And there is a reason why nobody's ever done that before, and nobody ever done, has because done that since. these days people tend to focus more on quality rather than quantity. <laughs> Perhaps delaying the release of Life Force might have saved it from clashing with Cocoon and also headbutting with the likes of the Goonies and Rambo, but Golan and Globus didn't see it that way. They just want to get the movie finished and out in cinemas as soon as possible. Maybe so they could then move on to the next movie. And the next. And the next. At their peak, Canon was a huge company that produced an almost constant stream of successful cinema releases, as well as owning the international video rights for several classic film libraries, and even owning a chain of cinemas as well. Many of your childhood movies were probably watched in Canon cinemas. They were big money makers, and as it turned out, they were big money spenders as well. Yes, and uh, as it turns out, they were quite happy at the time to spend stupid amounts of money um, on an, an erotic sci-fi horror movie about a naked woman sucking out Patrick Stewart's soul and turning horny men into mindless shrieking zombies. Cannon threw $25 million in the direction of Topher Hooper to, to, to make Life Force. Let's just put that into some sort of perspective. Um, two years previously, we had Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Uh, and that, with the amount of space battles to pay for, and of course William Shatner's huge ego to fuel, that had only cost 11.2 million to make. Um, and then by the time that the Canon Group got hold of Superman 4, um, basically because Warner Brothers didn't really know what to do with it after the disappointment of Superman 3 and, yep. and Supergirl, sort of Canon swooped in and, and got hold of it. Um, they then realised that once they got the licence for Superman, that they were having serious cash flow problems, uh, which shouldn't really come as a surprise, really, and they couldn't afford the same kind of special effects budget that the previous three movies had. Um, $25 million on Life Force turned out to be considerably more than what Cannon spent on Superman 4, whose original um, intended $36 million budget was slashed to $17 million. And it showed on screen too, not just with the special effects, but the fact that they then had to move filming location to Milton Keynes in the United yes. Kingdom. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to Milton Keynes, but it doesn't really double as Metropolis. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, original, originally Superman 1, 2 and 3 was filmed in New York. Yes. I think. Well, it, it certainly looks like it. It, it certainly, certainly does look like it. But, but anyways, major, major metropolitan American city. Milton Keynes. <laughs> it's, it's not the same, no, is it? Here's a not. picture of New York. Yeah. Here's Milton Keynes. Here's Milton Keynes. <laughs> it's not quite the same, really, is it? <sighs> We could go off on a tangent on Superman 4 as well. Oh, I mean, no, no, we really couldn't. The villain, Nuclear Man, with his big blonde mullet and his sharp fingernails. Sharp fingernails. Oh, scratch your hair, the eyes out, dearie, you know. <laughs> and there's that bit where Superman like fixes the Great Wall of China by staring at it. You know, yeah, you know, his red eye beams, his heat vision, but what basis do the blue eye beams work on? Is, is it imagination, perhaps? Had Superman looked into the future and seen Minecraft? I could just read... Although to be honest, to, 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 to be honest with you, um, uh, that I, I kind of like to think of that now as a as an interesting homage to nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties Superman stories, where basically Superman developed a, power, a new power every single issue for a specific problem. Just, and yeah, yeah. yeah. But at that time, he could create like a tiny miniature version of himself. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> just, just, don't ask why. We, no, just, we, we can just do it. There's, there's no tension at all where you can, your character can just literally neck up a power on the spot and go, right, that's, that's me sorted. So despite having a $25 million budget for Life Force, that wasn't enough for the movie. Uh, the film went over schedule during production. Because of this, some important scenes were never shot. 
and the film was actually shut down at one point because the studio had simply run out of money. So if there's moments where the film seems like it doesn't make a, a, a whole lot of sense and seems a little uh, incoherent at times, that's because there's scenes missing from it. Who would have thought? <laughs> you see, Cannon decided at the last minute to change the name of the film to Life Force because they felt that that was a much more striking title and it would allow Cannon to get away from their reputation of putting out genre B-movies. Now, whilst the film may no longer have a B-movie a title, it is still very much a B-movie from beginning to end. From its basic premise of vampires in space, to the zombies wandering around, to the vast amounts of excessive female nudity, to the concluding moments where Peter Firth is stabbing a giant bat alien in the chest with an iron sword, it is an extremely bizarre film. Hooper, to his credit, knows he's making a bizarre film, and so he fills it with plenty of exploding bodies, flashing lights, copious amounts of blood and gore, and the same kind of warped, twisted sense of humour that he had in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist. Canon Films certainly had high expectations for Life Force and made huge announcements stating that this was going to be the cinematic sci-fi event of the 80s. But then again, that's nothing new for Canon. They were renowned for over-promoting movies that did not live up to expectations. Uh, they even went so far as to describe Masters of the Universe as the Star Wars of the 80s. It, it wasn't. It, it really wasn't. Oh. Although it probably explains why Skeletor appears to have picked up a load of stormtroopers from somewhere. Well, yes. <laughs> I, can, I, can feel, I can clearly remember feeling very, very let down by that film. Masters of the Universe, yeah. yeah. Um, I, even as a kid, I sort of thought, well, the cartoon had such a well-known theme song. Why yeah. did we get a big orchestral version of that rather than mm. what we got on the soundtrack, which sounded like they'd basically taken a bit of Superman and a bit of Star Wars and mashed, mashed it together. together? Yeah. What was wrong with <laughs> doing a big orchestral version of the He-Man and the Master of the Universe cartoon? That theme? certainly would have. That, that certainly would have would have worked. But, um, um, at no point is is He-Man Prince Adam. He's He-Man for oh, that entire film. I mean, we could probably go off on a completely separate yeah. tangent about Master of the Universe. So let's and, and how bad it is and how bad it is. But uh, you don't need to tell us that. I mean, even Dolph Lundgren to this day, although he does have fond memories of sort of going, "Well, yes, I was He-Man." Um, he did also feel rather foolish at times making uh, yes. films, especially when he was stripped down from his furry pants and a guy was whipping him while Skeletor sort of looked awkward. <laughs> That was sinister. That. What was all that about? It was, it, the worst thing about it was that, that, that obviously the skeleton, the, 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 you know, in, in the cartoon skeleton is, is actually a skeleton, so they, they couldn't actually do that. I think it would probably be done better these days with better visual effects and what have you. But it's quite clearly Frank Langella in a mask. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he couldn't, doing his it, very best as well. He man. couldn't act in the mask though. That's the that's the problem. He, he could get it. Is all he, though. Bless him. I mean, the masks made. For 1970s Doctor Who, <laughs> look cutting edge. Yes, compared to that. <laughs> and in some of the masks that they created for that, you, you know, they couldn't even move the jaw of the mask, so the the, the, the actor inside couldn't actually pop a blade half like that. And just mental. But that's Masters of the Universe. That, that's probably going to be another episode oh at some point. God, don't put me through that again. <sighs> 